today, we are going to be speaking, uh, I will be speaking, and we will all be learning um, a very unique, uh, a, very, a topic that is not usually taught much anymore, um, especially within my generation. Um, how should we as Christians give correction? Um, first off, I'd just like to say correction is a good thing. It, it's a good thing if it is done within the Spirit of God and if it is done within the Holy Spirit. Yes. Within the church today, we really do confuse correction and conviction with condemnation and harshness. How can we stop this? How can we change the way we, the church, looks at this and sees the right way to handle these situations? Um, and this only applies to Christians. What we need to do for those who don't know Christ, what we need to do for the lost, is we need to bring them the love and grace of Jesus because it is, it is unfair to hold the standards of the Bible to one who does not believe that it's true. That's right. So when we go and we go to the lost, we give them the love and the grace of Jesus. Then they become saved, and when they are saved and they have Christ living within them, now we hold them to the standards of the written word. So there are many, there are many ways. There, uh, there are three significant parts um, to correction. Um, they're very distinct. They are very different. Uh, the first one, the first one that I see, uh, the first one that God has revealed to me is the one that I see in, our, in my generation. The 20-somethings, the, the, the college students, the high school students. Uh, first one, we do not want to have anything to do with correcting people because it's not our job to judge them. In some aspects, we're right not to judge. Is it fair to judge someone in a sin you yourself are committing? It says in Matthew 7, 3, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? It also says in Matthew 23, 13, What sorrow way to teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of God in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. The Pharisees were renowned for their knowledge of the scripture. The Pharisees were renowned for the knowledge of the word and the memorization. They could have helped anybody and everybody who has come to them and in need of help and in the struggles in their lives. But it was all void because of them knowingly sinning and their blatant ignorance to the fact that they needed to change. And because of that, God can no longer use them in any capacity. It is the difference between a head knowledge and a heart knowledge of God. Yeah. We may know that God exists. We may know that there is a God and that God is real. But we may have not made him the Lord of our life. There's a difference between knowing that there is a God and making God the Lord of your life. But when it comes to the church and her children, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5.12, It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. If you claim the name Christian, then this applies to you. In any part of your walk with Christ, but not to be confused with holding everybody to the same level of spirituality. Those, uh, those who are more mature in, in, uh, in our walk are held to a higher standard. It says in James 3.1, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's right. Amen. Now this shows that there are different levels of spirituality. Your pastor, the pastor of your church, needs to be more have a deeper relationship with Christ than maybe someone who is a lay person or someone who's coming to church for the first time. Because if we are all held to the same level of spirituality, then our God becomes an unfair and unjust God, but that can't be possible because it specifically says in the scriptures that we have a just and perfect God. Amen. But just because there are different levels of spirituality does not mean we are permitted or even encouraged to stay at the level where we are at. It says in Hebrews 5.12, you have been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again yes. the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. The level of spirituality where you are at is okay, but you are never permitted to stay there. Because if you stay there, God cannot then put more blessing upon you or give you more opportunities because now you have not grown. We see it, we see it in our own selves. I was, I was five years old at some point. I am obviously not five years old right now. 
because we are to grow. Our lives are an example of how we should grow spiritually. The way we grow in our physical human bodies is an example of how we should grow spiritually. We are never to stay young. We are always to grow and mature. Yeah. It is a fact of life. Okay. In Romans 14, 23, but if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For if you, if you are not following your convictions, uh, for you are not following your convictions, if you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. Different Christians, uh, different levels of spirituality within Christians have different convictions on certain things versus drinking alcohol or not drinking alcohol. There's, there's, a, there's a big gap, right? There's a big gap there. But if the Bible clearly spells out a sin, like getting drunk, that is a sin. In Galatians 5.21, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these, let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, my great-grandfather's uh, favorite verse, and a great verse I think that you could live by, uh, is James 4.17. If you know what you ought to do and do not do it, that is a sin. Amen. Amen. But also, just a, a warning to those handling the correcting. If you're going to correct somebody, um, handle another man's faith with gentleness and respect, because that is all yes. I have. Yes. Yes. Paul is clear here about holding each other responsible in our walks with Christ. Because one person who is walking in darkness within the church can not only affect the people around them, but also affect the atmosphere of the church and prevent new people from coming into the fellowship. If you bring your, I, I'm not telling you not to bring your stuff here, but you need to bring your stuff here, the stuff that's in your heart, the stuff that's in your life, you need to bring it here so you can give to God. But if you bring it in here and you let it ferment and you let it permeate, it's going to infect the church, it's going to affect people around you, it's going to affect, infect uh, your church leaders, it's going to affect your pastor, and then people are going to come walking in here and they're going to expect to come into a place of God, but instead of coming into a place of God, they're going to come into a place of envy, of jealousy, of complacency, and they're going to come in here and be like, "Well, where the heck, where is God?" We need to bring our stuff so we can leave it here, so God can take it and get it out of this place. In Galatians five seven, this is actually what it says in the Message version: um, "You were running superbly, who cut in on you, deflecting you from the true course of obedience." It also says in First Corinthians twelve twenty six. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. Yes. And if one part is honored, all parts are glad. Mm -hmm. If one part of the church body suffers, it's like a disease. The infection spreads. Sin can never be contained. Sin can only be destroyed. If you try to contain sin, it will leak. Guarantee. Guarantee it. It never says in the Bible that we can contain sin. You've got to cast it out. If there is no medicine introduced to a dying body, the body will die. Uh, there were about two, oh gosh, what was it, two summers ago now? Two summers ago, uh, I come back from a, a King, uh, creation fest of 2013, and uh, I had a little cramp in my calf, right at the base of my calf here, nothing big. I thought it was a cramp. Go to the doctors, the doctors give me an x-ray, and they touch me like, oh yeah, it's sciatica. I'm like, all right, I don't know. 19 years old, and you tell me I say, I have a problem. So I go out, and then for the next three weeks, I just go about my life. But it not only still hurt, it's the hurt and the pain started going up my leg. And it got to a point, three weeks later, where I had a fever. There was no reason I should have had a fever. There was no right, rhyme, or reason, or medical reason why I should have had a fever, but I did. And then I go to the hospital that night, and the lady is going up and down my leg with a uh, ultrasound machine. And the doctor had already said, you may, have, you may have a blood clot in your leg. I'm like, oh, that is significantly different from sciatica. OK, good to know. So the lady is going up and down my leg with, uh, with the ultrasound. And she's, I asked her, can you not find it? She goes, no, I'm tracing it. I had a three foot long blood clot in my left leg. Ooh. And the doctor couldn't figure out how I was still walking, let alone how I was still alive. The infection spread without any introduction of medicine. We are the needle, but God is the medicine. 
Yeah. Sometimes we like to think of ourselves as medicine. How we can, how can we fix the situation? We cannot fix the situation, but we can be a conduit to fix the situation. Yes. Yes. But being a conduit to fix the situation is not a, it, it's a privilege, not a right. Yes. We always go to God and say, God, help me fix the situation. But if your life is screwed up and God can't use you, he won't use you. If you're struggling with sin, and you're struggling with habitual sin, and you can't get out of that, and you can't stop doing it, then God's going to have to go somewhere else. God wants to go to you, but because of the stuff that we have done, we, God can't go to us. The second one, the second point. If you're doing something wrong, I'll be the first one to tell you. I can't believe that you're doing this. How could you? What you are doing is so wrong and awful. Galatians 6 1. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into that same temptation yourself. So many Christians confuse boldness and being straightforward with harshness and condemnation. The way that we use our words is also very important. We may be telling somebody the truth, but how are we saying it? Are we yelling it at them? Are we saying it in a rude, sarcastic way? Or are we saying it that we show an intention of actually helping them out of what they're in? These are all things that we should be thinking about because we need to show love in everything that we do. In James 3, James 3 uh, talks about words very specifically and the power that they hold and what they can do. Uh, James 3, 2 through 10. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For we can control our tongues, we would be perfect, and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by the means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It, is, it can set the whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless. It curses those who have been made in the image of God. So blessing and, uh, so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. I can't stand swearing. I can't stand it. Because swearing is specifically cursing. I don't like it when Christians come up to me and say that they can swear if they're alone. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes, it does. If you are practicing swearing, if you're practicing words that you know you should not be using in your privacy, how long will it take before you that word right. slips? Yeah. How long will it take before that word is said to someone and because you have not said that, they are completely turned off to anything about God because they know that you're a Christian, but you're a Christian, but you're saying these words. So how does that correlate? It doesn't. It does not correlate at all. The, I hear that there's a story. Um, one of my Christian friends, a very strong Christian friend, and um, but like everybody, we go through hard times. We go through rough patches. And so he was sitting at home one day, and he was on Facebook, and one of someone from his church uh, Facebook messaged him, and they were having a conversation. And the, and this guy, he's, he's a Christian, but he was going through uh, troubles. And this guy is literally spewing scripture after scripture after scripture in the most unloving way, in the most uh, condemning way, saying, "You need to get over this. Get over this now. You're um, you're not, you're not that big of a deal. Get over yourself." Was he speaking truth? He was speaking truth. But how you speak truth is crucial to the fact if you are going to change or help change someone's course of life. There was one time I was uh, during the university. Was, I was with the, this is a different guy. I was with this guy. We were at a table doing a proxy table, and um, people could come up and ask us questions about God. And this guy and a girl came up, and they were. Uh, it was one of those trap questions, you know. If um, they asked us. Um, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And this is exactly what the guy did. Yeah, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. And I was like, no! We have now lost these people. 
They are completely turned off. Even if I, even if, if, if I come back and I say the exact right thing, or he comes back and he apologizes, what has now been said has turned them off to anything that we would have said about God. That's right. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have another story. I'm so filled with stories. I can't believe it. I'm only 20 years old and I totally love these stories. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, there was this, uh, there was this girl, a uh, 22 year old girl. Uh, she broke up with her boyfriend. She goes, she, she, she's a Christian. She was actually going to a ministry school at the time. And uh, uh, my friend and I um, went to comfort her and all that. But she started falling way away from God, way away. She, she started going out to clubs and drinking. She started um, hanging out with all these guys. I don't know if she was doing drugs or not. I hope not. Um, and at one point, she thought her she was a lesbian, um, a lesbian. And the greatest thing, and I say this not to speak out of pride, but I say this because this way is biblical. Don't leave those people. Amen. Now it says, like in Galatians six one, do not fall into the same temptation yourself. But it never says we need to bail. Because if we, if we as Christians, if we bail, if we're the light, if we are Christians, little Christ, if we are to show God's love and we bail, we are showing that God is not bailed. Yes, yeah, right. And that is not right. You need to show love and grace and patience. And I can tell you right now, there were times where I did not want to show love and grace and patience. This girl was literally taking me off. <laughs> but be biblical in what you do. If you are biblical in what you do, it will never be wrong. Again, it says in James 3, the tongue's a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark, one word, instead of great forest on fire. I was in my Old Testament class a couple weeks ago, um, and we were going over the ge uh, geography of the Middle East at the time of the Old Testament. And uh, one of the geographical sites uh, that we talk about was the Dead Sea. Uh, now, the Dead Sea is so salty that uh, nothing can live in it. Uh, there, there's nothing that can live in that sea. So it got me to thinking about Christians, how we were supposed to be the salt of the earth, as it says in Matthew 5.13. Uh, now, an average sea is salty, but it still has animals, plants, and entire ecosystems that inhabit it. But like our own Christian walks, if we are too salty, like the Dead Sea, nothing can live in us. So like an ocean, we were to be salty and bring God's flavor to the world, but not get to the point where we hinder God because we in our own selves want to be bold. When we in our own selves want to be bold, bad things can happen. If we feel like we, want, we need to be bold in this situation, if we feel like we need to be like, you know what, let's fix it. I'm just going to say that's my personality. Uh, if, I, if I don't understand a sin that someone is in, I'm like, come on, can I fix it? Fine, let's go. But if my, in me and my old self wants to be bold in that situation, those people can get farther and farther and farther away. And then it would be my fault because those were my actions not led by the Holy Spirit. Words are powerful. You can either build up or destroy with them. You can either bring life or bring death to a situation with words. So when we speak to others, speak how God would, and don't let your flesh speak for you. The moment that you speak in your flesh is the moment that Jesus is now out of the equation. You have now taken Jesus, and you're like, no, Jesus, I'm going to set you out here so I can say what I want to say. I'm going to speak out of my anger. I'm going to speak out of my frustration. And I'm going to take Jesus. I'm just going to set him out here, and I'm going to say these words. The moment we say those words, Jesus is now excommunicated. We have taken them out. So many times we tell someone what is wrong in their lives, but we say it as if they committed some horrible and awful crime. We're going to mess up. It's going to happen. I messed up this week. But we need to go to them in gentleness and kindness and explain to them what, what's going on and how we can help them out of that situation with God's help. When you talk to someone, talk and speak the truth, and speak the truth in kindness and grace. Do everything in your part to speak as Jesus would. 
Yeah, amen. Do everything in your part to act as Jesus would act. And how they take it, now that, that is now on them. How they respond to that is now that's on them. It says 2 Corinthians 8, 3, and they did it of their own free will. As much free will as we have to do something or to not, as much free will as we have to not do something, everybody else in the world has the same exact free will if they did that. If they did that. Yeah. If I have self-control not to smoke, other people have the same free will to choose to smoke. As much free will as we have, so does everybody else in the world, and sometimes we as Christians can forget that. Third one. With my third and last point, I see that you are sinning, and it is wrong. But I am here to come alongside of you and help you get out of it because I care about you. This is the attitude that we should have when we go to someone and try and want to help correct them. This way is biblical and this way is true. More often than not, we see Jesus do it this way. We see this when Jesus saves a woman who's caught in adultery. In John 8, 10 through 11, it is written, then Jesus stood up and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't any of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Amen. He doesn't condemn her. But he also doesn't say, Well, it's okay. It wasn't that bad. If we call sin anything other than sin, that is a false gospel. Yeah. Amen. And that is the biggest thing that we see in modern evangelism today. If we call sin anything other than sin, that is a false gospel. That has now become the gospel of George, of the gospel of, of whoever says it. That has now become the gospel of whoever says that. He knows sin is bad. Jesus knows sin is bad and is not conducive to life. So when we go to correct someone, don't go to hurt. Don't go to put down. Don't go to break them. We go to them and tell them that sin is killing them spiritually, and we care enough to see them um, fix that and get right with Christ again. Our main goal is to not give glory to ourselves for fixing, the, fixing a situation. We go with the intention of getting that person back with God. We go to get nothing out of it. If we go with the intention of getting something out of correcting somebody, we have now done that for ourselves and we may say, oh, no, I'm here to correct them. I'm here to help them get back with God. Are you here to help them truly get back with God? Or are you here to say so later on that I, what I did, what I did help that person get right with Christ again? No, we, we are not in this equation. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sin. Yeah, that's in the Bible. It was once said, better it come from me than come from the mouth of God. <laughs> if it takes God himself to tell you something, you are probably in deep. You are probably so stuck. God could do that. But there is a church body that is already around you. Why not listen to them? Why not let God use them in your lives? I want to give a little story. This is not a true story, this is just an analogy. There is a person walking on a ridge, unknowingly to the edge of a cliff. Then his best friend comes alongside of him. He knows where his friend is headed, but just pats his friend on the back and continues to tell him it will be okay. He continues to do this, and they both fall over the cliff. Now raise your hand if this story makes sense. Okay, everyone's paying attention, that's fantastic. <laughs> You're probably asking yourself, why didn't the friend save him? That's the point. If you know that someone is going and doing self-destructive things in their life, the most unloving thing that you can do is know that there's a cliff and say, oh, it'll be okay anyway. Will it really be okay for them, or do you just not want to get involved? Oh, it's not my right to judge them. If someone's walking to the edge of a cliff, would you not grab them? If, a if, a, if, a, if a, someone's child, if, if a mother notices that her child is in the middle of the street and a car's coming, she's gonna stay there and say, it'll be okay. It'll be, don't, don't, don't worry about it. No, that's, gosh, that's not right. 
That is not right. So when we see someone sinning, stop them. But do it in a loving, kind, and loving and kind way as Jesus would do it. If you don't do that, and you let your friend fall over the cliff, and you are a part of, and if you go to them and say, oh, it'll be okay anyway, it will not only hurt your friend, but it will also hurt you. It will hurt you. I've, I've been a part of it. I've known people who have been a part of it that have not said anything. And it's not only ended badly for the other person, but it also ended badly for themselves. Not saying that we should fix it for our sake, because that is not the right part. We need to fix it because we care, because we love people. Let me, let me close with this. Correction is a good thing. It is. If it is being used in the correct manner and spirit-led. We as Christians have the Holy Spirit in us to discern what our actions should be in every situation that we are put in. So let us, let, let this really open my eyes. This really open my eyes to how Christ wants the church to be. We should have each other's backs all the time. We should never come to a church and say, oh my gosh, dude, she went out and drank last night. Dude. I don't know. I don't know what she was doing. I don't know what she was thinking. It was just bad. Never the attitude. Attitudes of those churches, that's why churches die. It says in Ephesians 4, 1, Therefore I, a prisoner of the Lord, that you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. You have been called by God to be a servant, follower, and above all his child. So love your siblings in Christ enough to speak the truth. Because the moment that we stop doing that is the moment that we heard the kingdom of God. Let's close in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, Lord, we thank you. We thank you because we, you are God, and that is just the way it is, and that is a comforting thought. God, correction is a tricky thing. When we go to correct, sometimes we do it out of our own out of our own pride. <coughs> Sometimes we do it because someone's making this too. But God, I pray that every time we go, every time you call us to correct someone's life, we do it in the manner that Jesus would do it, and we do it in the manner that would bring glory to you only. God, please go with us today. Keep this on our minds. We're in a time where this is taboo. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to. We don't want to care. We don't. Sometimes we don't even care. But God, you care, so therefore we should care. So God, please go with us from this place. Please bless our day, bless our lives, and speak to us, and show us the right way to correct in the situations that we are put in. And all the church said in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, I look around and I've gone to see a number of different churches and always see is older people in a lot of the churches. And I thank God that he is still raising up some of the young. Yeah. Let me tell you, tomorrow some of us won't be here. Who's going to carry on the work? And so we thank God that God is raising up people 20 years old. Sometimes we think they don't know too much. But it's surprising when they speak under the anointing of the Holy Spirit how much wisdom. You got talking about stories. <laughs> There's a scripture, and I can't recall it verbatim, but I just tell you what it says. God has chosen the foolishness of preaching, whereas some might be saved. You know, I've always thought about that, and the stories that preachers tell, and the jokes they tell, laughter's good medicine, you know. 
Uh, and it is true that it's what we say, our actions, and what we do that affect others. So I thank the Lord this morning that God is still raising up someone for the church of tomorrow when you and I are going to.